Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continued discussion of culture in the 1950s. In the last few lectures, we've been talking about the so-called counterculture that ran through American culture in contrast to the culture of consensus in the post-war years. In this lecture, we're going to continue that discussion, looking at a number of different elements of American society and concluding with some thoughts about television in the 1950s. While many comedians during and after World War II plied their trade very much in line with the culture of consensus and supporting a very patriotic pro-American view of the world, there was a strong undercurrent among comedians, and so-called rebel comedians of the 1950s braved new subject matter and comedic style. These rebel comedians were rooted in the tradition of the tumbler, a sort of comic gesture at Jewish celebrations. In the 1920s and 30s, there were many of these tumblers, serving as entertainment at resorts in the Catskills. Comedians like Red Buttons, Lenny Bruce, Jerry Lewis, and many others rose up through these ranks, sort of a comedian's minor leagues. One of the most groundbreaking of these comedians was Mort Saul, who came from the ranks of the tumblers to make his debut on December 25, 1953, at a small comedy club in San Francisco called The Hungry Eye. Saul was quick to satirize American politics and social issues. In contrast to comedians like Bob Hope, one of the most famous mainstream comedians of the 1950s who plied in safe, innocuous, patriotic humor. Saul used to like saying, is there any group I haven't offended? Saul pioneered what was called the new comedy of dissent, shredded the Cold War certitudes of the day. Joe McCarthy doesn't question what you say so much as your right to say it, said Saul. He spoke out on issues like politics, nuclear war, sex, and race. And in our modern era, we see comedians like Bill Maher or Jon Stewart or other late-night comedians who do this very often. But in that day, this was groundbreaking. Mort Saul and the Hungry Eye blazed new ground, and many other comedians followed. The underground comedy movement especially benefited from the growing popularity of recorded comedy. Lenny Bruce, Woody Allen, Bob Newhart, and dozens of others recorded albums and began making names for themselves. One figure that aided the underground comedy movement was Hugh Hefner. Hefner, at age 27 in 1953, decided to start a new men's magazine. The result was Playboy. Hefner was raised in a prosperous and devout Chicago family. He served in the Army, graduated from college, started a family, and worked in management for Children's Activities magazine. Hefner sought to create a tasteful men's magazine, finding a middle ground between pornographic girly magazines and boffo, sweaty armpits, rugged men's journals. It was oriented towards a well-educated, middle-class male audience. The message was, enjoy yourself. It treated sex playfully and innocently. The first cover girl, famously, was Marilyn Monroe, pictured here. Within a few years, Playboy was on its way to becoming an empire, with nightclubs and spin-offs, and Hefner became a household name. Hefner threw his influence behind the rebel comics. Playboy was filled with cartoons and jokes, and also interviews. He ran many articles about the rebel comics and published interviews with them. He had them star in his nightclubs. While the rebel comics were considered by some cultural troublemakers, and many Americans were concerned about their cynical message, they also connected with many other Americans who saw insight in their cutting daggers against American politics, the government, war, and so on. Also a representative of the countercurrent in American culture was honky-tonk country music. This was music popular in the honky-tonks, roadside dance establishments popular with truckers. Country music was growing rapidly in popularity during World War II, as its messages found a wider audience, 
messages of loneliness, separation, and loss. Also, Southerners moved to the north into defense industries, and soldiers traveled the world over, all of them taking their music with them. So in the late 1940s and into the 50s, country music was on the rise. The leading honky-tonk singer was Hank Williams. Honky-tonk addressed themes that mainstream pop music rarely touched. Things like divorce, infidelity, unhappy relationships, even murder. Hank Williams himself lived a troubled life, filled with emotional intensity and depression, and he channeled those emotions into a string of hits in the early 1950s. Among his most famous songs were Your Cheatin' Heart, My Son Calls Another Man Daddy, and I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. This was all part of the growing popularity of country music in that era. So we've talked about the culture of consensus in the years after World War II, and the counterculture that was clearly in opposition to it. Perhaps even more common during this era were mixed messages being sent in Cold War popular culture. Not all examples are so clear-cut on one side of the cultural mainstream or the other. Many Hollywood productions, for instance, sent mixed messages. One of Marlon Brando's films, and one of the biggest movies of this era, was The Wild One, and it's one example of these mixed messages. It was a film about a motorcycle gang that tore apart a town. At the heart of the film was a troubled youth, Marlon Brando, who was the gang's leader. In one famous sequence, a young woman asks him, what are you rebelling against? And he replied, Well, what you got? Still, the conclusions of this story sent a mixed message. Brando's character longed for the companionship of a waitress named Kathy, who represents all that is good in the world. In the end, though, Brando rides out of town without Kathy, and order is restored in the community. There's a similar kind of mixed message in James Dean's signature role, Rebel Without a Cause, from 1955. James Dean in the film plays an alienated high schooler named Jim Stark. In movie posters and ads, he appears to be the ultimate symbol of teen angst and revolt. But the movie's message is hardly radical. The film supported tight-knit, supportive families and helping those in need. By the end of the movie, Jim no longer has any reason to protest. Nonetheless, images of rebellion remained popular in the 1950s. Popular figures included Robin Hood and Davy Crockett, both of whom operated at the fringes of the law. And Westerns often incorporated both elements. Some turned to performance as a way of questioning authority by way of allegory. Science fiction films often represented some parallel in society, but as Rod Serling, who created The Twilight Zone in 1959, said, things which couldn't be said by a Republican or a Democrat could be said by a Martian. So there were many Cold War and political allegories in science fiction films. Them was about giant, irradiated ants who terrorized the Earth. The Incredible Shrinking Man was about a man who shrunk after being exposed to radiation. And On the Beach, in 1959, was about essentially the end of the world after a nuclear war. Some of these films celebrated unity among mankind to overcome aliens that threaten all of us. Others simply warned about the irrationality and danger of a world dominated by atomic bombs. And as we've noted, many films centered on the darkness lurking within society. Alfred Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock was perhaps the ultimate filmmaker in this vein. In his films, the so-called normal world masks horror lurking underneath. Normal-looking people commit heinous acts. Even innocent-looking works sometimes reflected the darker side of life in Cold War United States. Peanuts was started by Charles Schultz in 1950, famously starring Charlie Brown, the beleaguered little guy who suffered through life's constant battering. The first comic strip said, well, here comes old Charlie Brown. Good old Charlie Brown, yes sir, 
Good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him. Television also had its sampling of the countercurrent and sometimes the mixed messages of the Cold War. Comedy variety shows were some of the favorite shows of the 1950s. Perhaps the most popular was that of Milton Berle and Sid Caesar. Born in 1908 as Mendel Berlinger in Harlem, Milton Berle was a child actor and appeared in many silent movies as a child. He started on Texaco Star Theater on NBC in 1948. Billing himself as Uncle Milty, he was wildly popular. His comedy was fast-paced and filled with sexual innuendo. But some executives thought it was too spontaneous, body, urban, and ethnic, and didn't appeal in rural America. The networks phased him out by the mid-1950s. Another comedian who pushed boundaries on network television was Lucille Ball. She appeared in more than 50 movies before the hit show I Love Lucy. She opposed the HUAC investigations and almost ended her career. But in the wake of that, I Love Lucy debuted in October of 1951 and became the number one show on television within a few months. It was the top-rated show of the 1950s, and more than 50 million viewers watched each week when it was at its height. The show was not like others on television in many ways. Lucy challenged traditional gender roles, appearing bored with housework and her assigned roles. Many episodes address her desire to take on a public role, to make money and be famous. Nonetheless, Lucy herself insisted that she was just a typical housewife at heart, and many magazine articles repeated the phrase. Importantly, each episode ended with Lucy being restored to her proper place in the home, apologizing and with Ricky Ricardo, Desi Arnaz, taking her back. Television occasionally challenged racial barriers as well. In 1956, NBC aired the Nat King Cole show. While many entertainers signed on and the network backed it as best it could, sponsors shied away and the program was canceled before completing its first season. Nonetheless, this was the first time a black man hosted his own television show. Another non-traditional star of the 50s was Vladiu Valentino Liberace. He spent over a decade touring the country combining classical and popular music on the piano. He was a well-rounded entertainer. In February of 1952, the Liberace show premiered. It started as a small local program. There was room for experimentation in those days as there was lots of airtime to fill. Networks were generally cautious about picking up national programming so local stations could air alternative programs. By the mid-1950s, some 200 stations were airing The Liberace Show. He rose to stardom amid rumors that he was homosexual, even though it was condemned at that time. He was the subject of much rumor and slander in the press. And he was, in fact, gay. He portrayed himself as colorful and eccentric, much like Elton John would in the 1970s. One biographer has described him as the outsider in the middle of things. He appealed most to middle-aged women, perhaps who viewed him like a son. He was charismatic, folksy, and talked to the audience. In our next lecture, we'll talk about perhaps the most famous example of the counterculture in American culture at that time, rock and roll music. Mm -hmm.